lot of leftover cortisol in my system after vamp, but I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, good. What was the process like? Um, so the process was actually really nice. Um, I submitted what I thought was a final copy and it turned out to be a draft. Um, I met with the producers, they assigned me a writing coach, a performance coach, helped me edit things, helped me figure out what my ending could be. Um, my piece is actually very different than the one I turned in in the first place, and I think it's a lot better. So, say we are! So, uh, like most people, I started college not really knowing shit about shit. Um, I came in with a nebulous interest in why humans are weird, and a high school biology teacher had once complimented my bedside manner when I took another student's blood pressure. So, obviously, that spelled out a burgeoning career in neuroscience. <laughs> Accordingly, in my sophomore year at MIT, I found myself a position in a bona fide neuroscience lab, where my job was to run mice on mazes and record their decision-making patterns. I wasn't quite sure how this would help solve the mysteries of Huntington's disease, but I went about it with boundless enthusiasm anyway. Of all the mice I worked with, I had one particular favorite, which is the very first thing you're told not to do. His ID number was 4146, but I called him Zit Zit. If I trailed my finger in front of him and said Zit 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 repeatedly, he would follow wherever I led. That was a little trick I pulled up from watching Evie Carnahan handle her camel in the first Mummy movie. <laughs> when I learned to pick up and handle mice, Zit Zit was the first one to willingly crawl into my hands, and he ate out of them without fear. When I ran him in the maze, he never tried to climb out only occasionally scrunched up his nose in the way I came to read as, really, this again? He would wait patiently while I scooped out his allotted food and changed his water bottle, and he snuffled around in the cutest way when I weighed him for his weekly checkups. We were both new to the world of research, but it made it better to have a friend to learn with. After several months of running mice on mazes, the postdoc I worked for asked if I was willing to come in late the next Saturday to help with perfusions. Now, I didn't know what a perfusion was, but I also didn't want to look stupid in front of the person who held all my future lab assignments in his hands. Plus, I wanted to learn more about what real neuroscience research looked like, so I chirpily agreed, promising myself that I'd Google it later. My entire academic career up until this point had consisted of saying yes to things I didn't fully understand, so I figured this would be another adventure in learning something new. My cursory Google search that evening told me that perfusion was the passage of fluid through the circulatory system to a particular organ, which didn't really tell me much about what we might be doing. I encountered some mentions of tests that could be conducted to check for proper perfusion after surgery, so my best guess was that we would be doing some of those on post-op animals. This was not the case. In the context of rodent research, Perfusion is a technique for fixing brains so that they can be sliced and stained later. First, you anesthetize the mouse as gently as possible. You then cut open its chest cavity, placing a syringe needle into its still beating heart. You then use the mouse's own circulatory system to flush saline and formaldehyde through the vasculature of its brain. At this point, you cut through the skin of the scalp, break open the skull quickly, but not so quickly that you damage the brain and scoop the freshly fixed brain into a vial of formaldehyde. But heading into the surgery room for the first time that Saturday night, I knew none of this. As another student explained the procedure to me, demonstrating each step, I oscillated so quickly between wanting to vomit and wanting to cry that my panicked indecision somehow presented itself as a detached intellectual interest, betrayed only by the fierce trembling of my hands behind my back. As she pointed to the next mouse, the other student asked if I wanted to try my first perfusion, or if I wanted to watch her go another time. I was about to open my mouth to ask her to go again, anything to delay my having to do this. But then I noticed the number on the cage, 4146, my beautiful, precious seat seat. As much as I wanted to run out that door and never come back, I knew that I would never forgive myself if I did. I didn't know if he needed a friend, but I needed him to have one. I picked Zit Zit up out of the cage. He immediately scrambled deep into the crevice of my elbow, 
which in Mouse means I'm scared and I want a warm, dark place to hide. I spent a few minutes coaxing him out, and when his body lost the rigidity of fear, I stabilized his neck and injected him with the anesthetic. My brain continued its harried buzzing, but my hand steadied, and I worked through the rest of the perfusion procedure. When it was time to remove his brain from its casing in the skull, I started working with a grim determination, preparing to ignore the shame and despair of betraying something that I had loved. But something unexpected happened. I chipped away at Zit Zit's skull, revealing the brain underneath, but the sting I had ex expected was conspicuously absent. Instead, I was filled with a single-minded awe. That brain was the single most beautiful thing I had ever seen. This tiny, impossibly complex organ, smaller than a walnut, was responsible for everything that had made Zit Zit his sweet, patient self. The brain I scooped out of the dead out of the skull of the dead mouse I had loved posed the question of how the mind is created within and upon the substrate of the brain with an eloquence and urgency that convinced me that there is nothing else I would rather do with my life than spend it trying to answer that question. I left the surgery room with both a better understanding of the cost of science and a greater conviction in its importance. This new conviction, however, did not preclude the sadness that followed. When I went home that night, after many hours of perfusions on many mice, I sat on my bed for a while and cried. I know that on a scientific level, it changed nothing, and that the sliced brains would have looked exactly the same if I hadn't cried over the mice. But it still felt important to do so, to acknowledge that something had been lost. Science at its best is the pursuit of truth. And while the truths that neuroscientific research reveals are often on the scale of individual neurons or synapses, they cannot be fully understood independently of the human context in which they are discovered. My grief over Zizi won't change the way we understand the structure of his brain. It's not the kind of finding I would publish in a scientific journal. But it does change the way I go about my research, the mechanisms I seek to understand, the way I pursue truth. To me, the desire to better understand the brain is not something clinical or detached. It's deeply personal and emotionally involved work. As fraught as the process of perfusing Zit Zit was, that horror was exactly what made me realize why I love neuroscience. The sudden realization that I would forever lose this mouse's snuffle-nosed curiosity and uncomplicated affection made it clear that what I was sacrificing were the exact same things that make the mind and brain worth understanding in the first place. I still have the same interest in why humans are weird that I entered college with, but now it's a little less nebulous. We're weird because we love things. We're weird because we destroy them. We're weird because we're insistently self-contradictory, but that pattern of contradiction creates its own paradoxical consistency. We're weird because understanding is painful and difficult and the single most important thing we can do. We're weird because we're human, and we're human because we're weird. Give it up for Katie O'Neill, everybody!